And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Edmontosaurus slash Anna to Titan, which was a request from Marcos via Patreon. So thanks, Marcos. It was a hadrosaurid, you know, duck build, dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Western North America. And there's two known species. There's Edmontosaurus regalis and Edmontosaurus enectens. The type species is Edmontosaurus regalis. And that species name means regal or king-sized. Edmontosaurus the genus is named after Edmonton, the capital of Alberta, and the fossils were first found in southern Alberta. So there's a long history here. Obviously, it's it's had multiple names. It's more than just Anna to Titan. Edmontosaurus regalis was named in 1917 by Lawrence Lamb based on two specimens found in Alberta that George Sternberg had found in 1912 and 1916. However, there are a lot of species that are now classified as Edmontosaurus that were named earlier, including Edmontosaurus enectens, which Charles Marsh named in 1892, and that had originally been called Plausaurus, and then Trichodon, then Anatosaurus, and now Anatosaurus and Anatotitan are now usually considered to be synonyms of Edmontosaurus, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Charles Marsh named Klausaurus and Ectens in 1892, based on a partial skull roof and skeleton and a second skull and skeleton. These specimens were collected in 1891 by John Bell Hatcher in Wyoming. And Marsh described in 1889 a lower jaw that Hatcher found in the Lance Formation, and he named that Trichodon longiceps, and it was larger than a previous find by Edward Cope. Yes, this is a Bone Wars dinosaur, which is why there is so much history and yeah. stuff around it. <laughs> and so many names because they both overnamed dinosaurs. Yep. In 1904, a second mostly complete skeleton was found in the Hell Creek Formation by Oscar Hunter, a rancher in Montana. He and a friend debated over whether what he found was a fossil, and Hunter wanted to show that it was brittle and therefore not a fossil, stone, by kicking off the tops of the vertebrae, Ugh. which Barnum Brown, who eventually collected the fossil, was understandably unhappy about. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he said when he was unhappy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so what happened is Alfred Sensiva, another rancher, bought the specimen from Hunter for a pistol and then sold it to Brown, who excavated it in 1906. And in 1907, this and Cope's earlier specimen was mounted next to each other at the American Museum of Natural History and named Trichodon mirabilis. Hadrosaurids weren't well known at the time, and after Marsh died in 1897, Klausaurus enectens was classified as a number of genera. You got Klausaurus, but then it was at one point Thespaceus and Trichodon. And textbooks and encyclopedias mention the difference between Klausaurus, that was iguanodon like, and Hadrosaurus, which had the duckbill. But in 1902, Hatcher said Klausaurus enectens was synonymous with the duckbilled skull Hadrosaurid, and he thought nearly all the then-known hadrosaurids were synonyms of trichodon. This included a long list, but <laughs> some of them are hadrosaurus and thespesius. Uh, then in 1910, new fossils from Canada and Montana showed more diversity in hadrosaurids, and Charles Gilmore said in 1915 that Klausaurus enectens was the same as thespesius occidentalis. Between 1902 and 1915, two more Klausaurus enectens specimens were found. The first was known as the Trachodon mummy, found in 1908 by Charles Sternberg and his sons in Wyoming. And Sternberg was actually working for the British Museum of Natural History at the time, but Henry Fairfield Osborne bought the specimen for $2,000 for the American Museum of Natural History. And then in 1910, the Sternbergs found a second similar specimen in the same area, and it had skin impressions on it, and they sold that one to the Senckenberg Museum in Germany, where it still is. Lawrence Lamb described Trichodon Sowenae in 1902 based on a lower jaw found in Alberta, and it was described as having been assigned to Edmontosaurus regalis, but not many people think this is right. <laughs> and Trichodon is now considered to be a dubious genus. There were two other species included with Edmontosaurus in the 1920s, but were initially called Thespesius. In 1926, Charles Sternberg named a new specimen Thespesius Saskatchewanensis, and in 1942, Lowell and Wright decided, enough, we want to simplify the taxonomy of chrysalis hadrosaurids, and they named a new genus Anatosaurus to include a whole bunch of species, and this name means duck lizard. So assigned to this new genus were Thespesius, Trachodon longiceps, which again, based on a lower jaw only, and a new species called Anatosaurus copi, 
That name came from the two skeletons on display at the American Museum of Natural History that were previously known as Trachodon, but uh, at some point became known as Declonius. Anatosaurus became known as this classic duck-billed dinosaur, and as you can imagine, it was basically a wastebasket taxon for hadrosaurs. Yeah, it was called the duck dinosaur. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good name. <laughs> <laughs> so Anatosaurus copi, which at one point was Anatotitan, then eventually became Edmontosaurus enectans. Does that mean Anatotitan means giant duck? I think it would. <laughs> Maybe. I actually didn't. That's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, that one was found in 1882 by Dr. J.L. Wortman and R.S. Hill, and they found it for Edward Cope. They found it in the Hell Creek Formation. Cope described it as Declonius mirabilis. This is the American Museum of Natural History one. It was a combination of Declonius, a hadrosaur cope had named earlier based on teeth, and Trachodon mirabilis, which was also named based on teeth. But that one was named by Joseph Lady, and Cope thought that Lady did not properly characterize Trachodon and had abandoned it. So he assigned the older Trachodon species to the new genus Declonius. Lady had found that Trachodon was based on multiple types of dinosaurs, and he was working on revising the genus, but he hadn't formally declared anything. And then Lamb, in 1917, when he was naming the two Edmontosaur specimens, described them as similar to Declonius mirabilis. In the 1970s and 80s, Michael K. Brett Sermon re-examined this material and found that Anatosaurus enectans, the type species, was actually a species of Edmontosaurus, and he said that Anatosaurus copi was different enough to be a separate genus. This was part of his graduate work, and it's not considered to be an official publication by the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature, but it got out there and got people thinking. And in 1990, Brett Sermon and Ralph Chapman designed a new genus for Anatosaurus copi called Anatotitan. Then Anatosaurus saskatchewensis and Anatosaurus edmontoni were reassigned to Edmontosaurus. Anatosaurus longiceps became Anatotitan, either as a second species or synonym of Anatotitan copi. Because the type species Anatosaurus enectans became Edmontosaurus, Anatosaurus is no longer considered to be a junior synonym. At this time, at this point in time only, there were considered to be three species of Edmontosaurus. They had Regalis, Anectans, which included Anatosaurus edmontoni, and Saskatchewensis. Then, in 2007, Nicholas Campione and David Evans said that there were only two valid Edmontosaurus specimens, Regalis and Anectans, and they found that Anatotitan copi was a synonym of Edmontosaurus anectans. The Anatotitan skull was actually a mature Edmontosaurus anectans, they said. In 2011, Campionian Evans looked at all known Edmontosaurus skulls and found that the shape of the skulls changed as it grew. The skull became longer and flatter, and this led to mistakes in classification, and according to them, meant that the Species Edmontoni, aka Edmontosaurus enectans, was more likely a subadult uh, Edmontosaurus regalis, and also that Edmontosaurus saskatchewensis represented juveniles, Edmontosaurus enectans were subadults, and Anatotitan copi were mature adults. It's also possible that Trachodon longiceps is also a synonym of Edmontosaurus enectans. There are some Edmontosaurus specimens that were found in Alaska and western Texas that have since been reassigned away from Edmontosaurus to other genera. There's Ugrinolic and Cretosaurus, and I believe we've talked about both of those. Yeah, I think so. When it, they were reassigned, because it was pretty recent. So Edmontosaurus, now that we have covered the history, it's a Sauralophene hadrosaurid, which is the group that had solid crests or fleshy combs on their head instead of large hollow crests like Lambiosaurinae. It's one of the largest hadrosaurids. It grew up to 39 feet or 12 meters long and weighed 4 tons. It's possible it even got larger than that, up to 49 feet or 15 meters long, and weighed 9 metric tons, and this is based on a couple specimens that are still being studied. However, very large Edmontosaurus were probably rare due to environmental stress or disease, and also they were prey. <laughs> There's a lot of bone beds that have been found. One in the Lance Formation has remains from 10 to 25,000 Edmontosaurus. Really? Apparently. That's crazy. I wonder if it's that many bones or that many individuals, because that would be an insane number of individuals. Yeah. But based on these bone beds, it's possible that Edmontosaurus lived in groups and they may have even migrated. So Phil R. Bell and Eric Snively said in 2008 that Edmontosaurus may have migrated annually 1,600 miles or 2,600 kilometers round trip between Alaska and Alberta, but not everybody agrees with this. And actually, Chissimi and others in 2012 found that hadrosaur remains in more polar regions were from groups that lived there all the time and didn't migrate. So it's kind of up for debate. Yeah, that's a tough one to measure. Definitely. 
Uh, Edmontosaurus was an herbivore, and it could move on both two and four legs. It probably walked on two legs when moving fast, and it had really powerful leg muscles. It could run up to 28 miles per hour, 45 kilometers per hour. Didn't we see a recent study that was looking at another hadrosaur, and it said the fastest thing was galloping? I can't remember. Uh, That sounds familiar, but I can't remember which one. And I don't think they looked at stresses on the body and things. There were a couple kind of limiting features. No, it was hopping. That's what it was. It worked out to be hopping. Oh, that was for the Edmontosaurus. They looked at it as kangaroo hopping, but it didn't seem feasible to actually do. Yeah, Yeah. that was fun. There might have been for other dinosaurs too, but I did just read this about Edmontosaurus specifically. (laughs) I love that idea. Yeah. And Montessori, they were bulky and they had a long flat tail and obviously a head with a duck-like beak. And they held their tail horizontally. The tail had ossified tendons, so it was ramrod straight. This stiff tail may have helped them with balancing, especially when they're changing between two and four legs. And hadrosaurs, unfortunately, sometimes are known as the cows of the Cretaceous. But it turns out they may have been more powerful than we realized because they had these large back legs and these muscly tails and they can run faster than a T-Rex. But horses of the Cretaceous does not have alliteration, so I still vote for cows of the Cretaceous. And they were prey, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the largest known Edmontosaurus skull is 46 inches or 118 centimeters long. And Edmontosaurus, as I mentioned, they had these comb-like crests on their head and triangular skulls. Its head is bigger than that troodontid that was just found in China. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Some Edmontosaurus skulls were so well preserved that scientists could make casts of the brain cavity and they found that it had a proportionately small brain, which isn't too surprising. There's bones around its nasal openings that had deep indentations, which may have held inflatable air sacs. And scientists have found sclerotic rings in the eye sockets and stapes, which is reptilian ear bone, in Edmontosaurus specimens, which are rarely preserved. Edmontosaurus anectens has a longer, less robust skull than Edmontosaurus regalis, and Edmontosaurus regalis comes from an older formation than Edmontosaurus anectens, though they've both been found in the same area. So the older formations there are the Horseshoe Canyon and St. Mary River formations, and the younger ones are Frenchman, Hell Creek, and Lance. The latest Cretaceous. Yeah, they live till the end. Yeah. <laughs> Edmontosaurus also had a frilly ridge of soft tissue down the center of its neck and back, and they had four fingers in each hand, and the second, third, and fourth digits were about the same length and were put together via a fleshy covering. Their little finger was shorter and not connected to the other three. It had three toes on each foot, and they had hoof-like tips. Cope had originally thought that hadrosaurids were amphibious, based on the lower jaw being weakly connected and thought it might break off if it ate non-aquatic food, but he also thought that the beak was weak, and this turned out not to be true. Turns out their short fingers that Hadrosaurus had and the rigid tail were not great for swimming. So no, they were not really aquatic. But he wasn't the only one who thought that. There's a lot of scientists used to think that Edmontosaurus was aquatic and they ate aquatic plants. They thought that until the 1960s and 70s. And then William Morris in 1970 said that it had a diet like modern ducks and used its beak to filter plants and aquatic invertebrates. But this is now considered to be false. (laughs) Scientists have found skin impressions and possible gut contents of Edmontosaurus. It had this toothless beak, but it was covered in keratin. One of the the mummy Edmontosaurus at the Senckenberg Museum in Germany has some of this keratinous material on the beak. And it used its beak to cut food. It either cropped it or clamped its jaws on twigs and branches and then stripped off the leaves and shoots. It could eat food on the ground, and it could eat food that was off the ground up to 13 feet or 4 meters Probably grazed its food, though, based on wear patterns on the teeth. And it had these cheek-like structures so it could keep its food in its mouth. Based on the tooth structure, it probably sliced and ground its food. It had dental batteries, so it had up to 2,000 teeth at the back of its jaws. And it only had teeth in the upper cheeks and the dentaries. It continually replaced its teeth, and they took about half a year to form each. Their teeth grew in columns, and the number of columns depended on the size of the Edmontosaurus. So Edmontosaurus regalis had between 51 and 53 columns, and Edmontosaurus inectans had 52. From the 1980s to early 2000s, it was thought that hadrosaurids could chew by moving their lower jaw backwards and forwards, based on a model by David Vichample in 1984. But in 2008, Casey Holliday and Lawrence Wittmer published a study that found that Montosaurus did not have skull joints that would allow this motion. So a 2009 study by Vincent Williams and others said that there may have been a combination of movements, including an oblique kind of motion. That's like what we talked about last week with Diplodocus. Mm-hmm. There's been reports of gastrolus found in Edmontosaurus anectins. 
it was called Klausaurus originally, that Barnum Brown had found this specimen in 1900, but it's now thought that the gastroliths were actually gravel that washed in after the animal died. The Sternberg mummy specimens, they found two that had preserved tissue, may have had gut contents. Sternberg had reported on carbonized gut contents for the American Museum Natural History specimen, but that one hasn't been described yet. And plant remains in the Senckenberg Museum specimen were described, but it's not that easy to interpret. The plants may have been gut contents, or it's possible they just washed into the animal's carcass after it died. Edmontosaurus and Ecton specimens have been found with skin impressions, such as, again, the Trachodon mummy, and another specimen nicknamed Dakota. That one was found in 1999 by Tyler Larson in the Hell Creek Formation in North Dakota and announced in 2007. And they found, based on that, that most of the body was covered in scales. Hmm. Not as many specimens with skin impressions have been found for Edmontosaurus regalis, but some specimens have been studied, including one with a soft tissue crest on its head. It's not clear if Edmontosaurus inectans had a crest, and it's also not clear if this crest gave any indication of sexual dimorphism. Edmontosaurus lived all over western North America, and they seemed to prefer coasts and coastal plains. The Lance Formation, where some Edmontosaurus specimens were found, had a bayou setting with tropical conifers and palm trees around hardwood forests and a humid subtropical climate. And they lived among fish and salamanders, turtles, lizards, snakes, shorebirds, even small mammals. They also lived at the same time and place as Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus, because they're one of the last non-avian dinosaurs. As we mentioned, they lived to the end. Edmontosaurus bones were described as having tumors in 2003. There's a bunch of different things, even possibly metastatic cancer. This may have been genetic or from environmental factors. Osteochondrosis has also been found in 2.2% of 224 Edmontosaurus toe bones. These are pits in the bone in places where bones articulate, and this happens when cartilage is not replaced by a bone during growth. It's not clear if that's from genetics or trauma or feeding intensity or other factors. One specimen of Edmontosaurus inectans from South Dakota has tooth marks from small theropods on its lower jaws, and these were partially healed, so maybe the theropods attacked its throat and then it died of its injuries Oof. later. Gave its face a little chew. Ugh. Yeah, that sounds really unpleasant. <laughs> you can also see an adult in Montessoris and Ectans at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It has a theropod bite in its tail, probably from a T-Rex. It died before that bite healed, but it did have a bone infection. However, it survived the attack somehow. It either outmaneuvered or outran, or maybe it used its tail as a weapon against the T-Rex. Hmm. You can see two Edmontosaurus specimens at the Museum of the Rockies, and you can also see Edmontosaurus in Dinosaurs in Their Time, an exhibit in the Carnegie Museum. There's two T-Rexes fighting over a carcass. 